John Bevere, who wrote a book on offense called The Bait of Satan, I believe, he writes, offense cuts you off from God. We separate ourselves from the pipeline. I've never seen anything block blessings from heaven except offense. That's a pretty solid statement. Matthew 24, 10 through 13 says, and then many will be offended, will betray one another, will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. And so we are warned about this great falling away from the Lord that's going to happen in the end days. And be, I mean, I get so many conversations about that now. I believe a lot of people are discussing the times we're living in. I don't think it's a secret that we're in the end days. Those who fall away in this great falling away that's talked about in the end, in order to fall away, you had to be in faith somehow. Otherwise, you can't fall away from it. This is someone who abandons their religious faith. And the Bible says that apostates are people who made professions of faith in Jesus Christ, but never genuinely received him as savior. And these are the ones who say something like, Jesus is savior, but I have not yet made him Lord, as if there is an option like that, but there is not, there cannot be any such thing. He's either all or he's nothing. So it's an illusion to think he can just be your savior and not your Lord. At the people in this category, they live according to their own desires after making a profession of faith. They do not lay down their personal rights and personal desires for Jesus. They continue to live their life according to their own wishes. And according to the Bible, these are the pretend believers that are referred to here in the great falling away. Those who turn away from Christ never were really in Christ to begin with. As 1 John 2, 19 says, they went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but their going showed that none of them belonged to us. Those who apostatize are simply demonstrating that they were not true believers to begin with. They never were. And so for people who are struggling with me alluding to the loss of salvation, it is a salvation that was never existent. They were not in the faith. They professed Jesus Christ, but they never were followers of Jesus, disciples of Jesus Christ. They were not part of the community of believers that were out promoting the gospel. They never did that. So they really weren't truly born again because those are all fruits of being born again. So the ones who fall away professed faith but never acted on it. They stayed with the world. They look like the world. No one can tell that they're born again except for what they say out their mouth. Many are now thinking, obviously, that we're close to the return of Christ. Prophecy is being fulfilled globally in so many ways. I've never seen it fulfilled this rapidly in the church. It's being fulfilled by the nature it's being fulfilled. We're seeing things in nature we've never seen. And God warned that one of the signs of his return would be that many will be offended. Not some, many. He also warned lawlessness will abound and the love of many will grow cold. And the Greek word that he used here is agape, which is the love of God, which is unconditional. It's not based on performance or whether or not it gets returned to you. Author John Bevere writes, Offended people still may experience miracles, words of utterance, strong preaching, and healing in their lives. But these are the gifts of the Spirit, not fruits. We will be judged according to fruit, not gifting. A gift is given, fruit is cultivated. And generally, what suffers offense first is our pride. Pride leads us to expect that we are owed something. Pride is a worship of self. And in order for us to be free from offense, God has to destroy our pride. So he is going to allow a lot of offenses to come to reveal to us how serious of a pride issue we have. 
It's nice to get respect and affirmation, but we cannot be offended when it doesn't happen. The word offense used here in this sense of faith comes from the Greek word scandalon, which means the part of a trap to which the bait is attached. And to trap an animal, you need to hide the bait and hope they run into it or that they're lured into it. And the devil knows us well enough from observing us to know how to bait our trap. Francis Frangipane says, when we allow an offense to remain in our hearts, it causes serious spiritual consequences. Jesus named three dangerous results, betrayal, hatred, and cold love. When we're offended with someone, even someone we care about, we must go to them. If we do not talk to them, we will begin talking about them. We betray that relationship, whispering maliciously behind their backs to others, exposing their weaknesses and sins to others. We may mask our betrayal by saying we're just looking for advice or counsel, but if we are honest and we look back, we can see that we've spoken negatively far too often about people we're offended with. Our real goal is not to get spiritual help for ourselves, but to seek revenge towards the one who offended us by passing on information that will harm their relationship. And there isn't probably a worse manifestation of hatred than this. This is hateful behavior. For an offended soul, cold love, betrayal, and hatred are a walk into darkness. An offense can strike at our virtues or our sins, our values or our pride. It can penetrate and wound any dimension of the soul, both good and evil. And when the Holy Spirit exposes sin in someone's soul, if we refuse the opportunity to repent, we often become offended at the person who brought the teaching. Instead of humbling our hearts, we're outraged at the person who exposed it unknowingly. Paul told Timothy to reprove, rebuke, exhort. In 2 Timothy 4.2, he did not say exhort, exhort, exhort. But exhortation is what we receive in most churches. We have to be encouraged at times, but there are also times that we need to be reproved and rebuked. And today, sadly, most preachers are afraid to preach the truth because they fear people will react and actually leave the church. And the end result is a church of easily offended people who cannot grow beyond their inability to accept correction. There's areas in all of us that have to be confronted and disciplined. And the spiritual leader who refuses to discipline and correct those in sin is in disobedience to God themselves. They're unable to lead people into a transforming change in their life. So these people will not endure to the end, which puts a great amount of responsibility on the false teacher if they cannot be corrected. There's tremendous liability for not teaching real truth. We need to say, Lord, show me what needs to change in me. And this is about growing up. Everyone needs to grow up, those leading and the ones that they're trying to lead. They, it's almost, many of them will not live if they aren't allowed to grow in their faith. The wise man will receive a rebuke and he will prosper, but a fool rejects his father's discipline according to Proverbs 15.5. God says we can know which kingdom a person is from by their fruit. The fruit does not lie. And offended people produce a lot of fruit in the form of hurt, anger, outrage, jealousy, resentment, strife, bitterness, and envy. And this leads to insults, attacks, wounding, division, separation, broken relationships, betrayal, and then backsliding. And often those offended are so focused on what they felt was done to them that they don't even see that they have become trapped in a web with the enemy, that they are now missionaries for hell. Offended people are introspective and they filter everything through their hurt, their rejection, and their offenses. And they find it impossible to believe God and others are, who are not on their side and understanding their point. So they guard their rights and personal relationships very carefully and their energy is consumed with making sure no future injury occurs either from that person or of the same. The spirit of offense will never let you go. You have to let it go to become free. And because we've been called to a higher life, 
we have an enemy, the devil, who has declared war against us. And the more that you cause issues for him, the more seasoned you're going to need to become in offense because it comes rapid fire almost every day. First Peter 5, 8 through 9 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings were experienced by your brotherhood in the world. And one of the most successful weapons of the enemy is to cause us to become offended with each other. And this one named behavior is used to identify the end times. It's the one stated as watch for this to be there. And if you read or listen to any news or you watch social media, you're going to see this is pretty much the state of the world. It is attack after attack after attack and comments on any, any, even a story about flowers. A wounded spirit is not the same as an offended spirit. We may experience words or slander from someone that can deeply wound us, but we have to determine the outcome quickly. God has promised that he will help, that he will make all of this work for our good if this is what's coming at us, but we must process our wounds in a Christ-like way. And if we don't, then we're going to end up faking our Christianity because an offended spirit will soon appear as betrayal, hatred, and cold love, if not corrected. Jesus said offenses would be the main reason that will cause many to fall away from the faith. And Jesus connected the real cause of the great apostasy or falling away from the faith, not only to wrong doctrines, but to wrong responses. Without God, we can only love with a selfish love, one that is given if it is received and returned to us. And the Bible calls this the flesh. Galatians 6, 8 through 9 says, For he who sows to his flesh will reap the flesh, will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. So we should not see it as a failure when the love that we give is not returned. It's actually more common that it's not returned in the work that many of us do. God is our reward and God rewards us. But we are to love even more because our faith is growing and we're hopefully helping the kingdom to grow whether we can see it or not. If more understood this, they wouldn't be so offended because when we walk in a selfish love, we're always going to be easily offended. Jesus felt the same rejection we face. The disciples abandoned him in the garden, the, the people that had been with him steadily for three years. Then Judas betrayed him, then Peter denied him. Only John followed him and that was at a great distance. Jesus released them all from, from what he could have easily blamed them for. They weren't there when he needed them, but he released them from that. And he didn't even ask them for forgiveness. He just gave it freely. Matthew 5, 44 through 47 says, But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be sons and daughters of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same thing. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you have more than others? Don't even the tax collectors do that? So if we have certain expectations from certain people, those are the very people who are going to be able to offend us and disappoint us easily and by this course of they actually have control of us because if we are leaning on them for some type of fulfillment they control how well we do or don't do and the more we expect from them the greater the possibility of offense so rather have no expectations because then we're sowing the love of god into others by faith and faith always reaps a reward because there are no strings attached so rather than expecting anything from others so love anyway and let god reap
the reward for you. Proverbs 18, 19 says, A brother offended is harder to win than a strong city, and contentions are like the bars of a castle. We build walls around our hearts for the same reason. We don't want to be hurt again, and we deny entry to those who have hurt us before and might hurt us again. We wait for them to pay what they owe us before we will grant them peace and entrance. But it's simply delusional to only allow those inside your prison walls who agree with you. First of all, they don't. It's a, that's a delusion. But the problem is, is you have isolated all of that pain you feel inside your prison walls with you. Proverbs 18.1 says, A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. An unfriendly person pursues selfish ends and against all sound judgment starts quarrels. The love of God does not seek its own, but hurt people become increasingly self-seeking and self-contained, and this causes the love of God to wax cold. This person takes life, but cannot release life, and becomes a stagnant pool instead of a river of life, giving water, fresh water, to other people. 2 Corinthians 10, 4-5 says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So strongholds are sort of filters that have been set in our minds and all information that we process goes through them. And they're meant for protection, but now they become a source of torment because they wage war against the knowledge of God and they trap that war inside your mind. So when we filter through past hurts, rejections, and experiences, it's going to become impossible to believe or trust in the goodness of God. And we will start judging him by the standards set by the relationships that we have experienced in our lives and we find the Bible verses to support that position, which is what's sad. I had someone call me today and um, the person is in jail for assaulting them, but they were supporting their position biblically. The, the person who assaulted them was um, issuing a very long stream of Bible verses to explain what happened in that assault. If we choose to use Bible verses in that way, we're giving way to pride and legalism. Philips, Philippians 2, 3 says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each other, let each esteem others better than himself. We become quick to betray each other rather than lay our lives down for one another, which is what God commanded us to do. Why? Because our love has grown cold and we are seeking to protect ourselves rather than depend on God as a result. 1 Peter 2, 21-23 says, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled did not revile in return, when he suffered he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Jesus did not retaliate, he allowed God to be the judge, and we are told to do the same. And we must come to a place where we trust God because the sin of offense will eventually lead to death if it is allowed to remain. Unless properly identified, repented of, and changed, the spirit of offense will cause chaos. It will endlessly destroy relationships until it's dealt with. And when it makes its way into the church, it causes division, dissension, strife, hurt, and pain. Does this in families. It also destroys peace and unity, which is critically necessary for both churches and families to have to operate. Offense is a deadly weapon that kills relationships, builds up bitterness. It's linked to pride and control, and this is a deadly trio, bitterness, pride, and control. Removing offense from ourselves and assisting others requires us to identify the qualities of a defense, of an offense, and entitlement is a main one. We somehow feel that we're owed something. The truth is, we feel we deserve something that we're not entitled to. What we actually are entitled to 
and owed fairly is hell. That's what we're owed, nothing else. And that's the only thing. Entitled people will feel entitled to a position, a response. They feel entitled to respect, to honor, constant forgiveness when they say it. That's entitlement. And when they don't receive it, they get offended and rejected and you're gonna see a completely different side of that person. Pride is also a quality. Prideful people are self-reliant instead of reliant on God. And when pride attacks, it doesn't allow us to see reality. Lucifer, he was the first one who tried out pride and he was cast from heaven. And when people are offended, the offense is rooted in the same sin and it results in the same fall and the same banishment from God. Some feel shameful and unworthy. And when they're offered correction or help that they can interpret, they won't accept it. They want to blame others for their fall. They refuse to see their role in any of it. They say things like, I can't do anything right for you or I'm always messing up. This is all driven by pride and a focus on self and self-preservation. Another quality is unfairness. People with offense often feel that they've been treated unfairly. They get hurt. They build up resentment, bitterness when they aren't recognized the way that they feel they should be. They want to be honored more than they are. Respect is another. We've been taught to demand respect, but the Bible tells us to humble ourselves and serve with love. So we hear the world, even everyone in the church, a lot of times telling us of this one value system to demand and keep respect, be respectful, and people will respect you but it opposes the quiet voice of God that says serve and honor others and be humble. Another issue is holding on to things too long. Sometimes we're insulted and we just can't shake it, but we have to keep perspective. Friendships are valuable and it is helpful if we can let things go because if one thing is said and justifiably it, it caused harm, and you throw out a long-time friendship as a result of that one thing, uh, it's a priority problem. If that person wants to make amends and they want to be in relationship and not have that issue between, you should try to work it out. Another is assuming a negative intention. Never assume someone else's intention. Maybe the, what they did or said does not mean what you thought they did or said and you need to give them the benefit of a doubt and I regret how many times this has happened to me and the two times lately where it became cataclysmic to relationships I honestly after hearing many times cannot even figure out what happened it's not even clear yet I do not know what they're angry about it's, it's hard when they assume something happened by something that was nothing. You, don't, you weren't even focused on anything. Control is another. Offended people want to control a situation, and when they can't, they get offended and they will leave. They really need strong, faithful leaders that won't put up with their selfishness. Only then they might receive healing and move forward into a life of obedience that can be meaningful because there are no lone rangers out here that God is really using. Everyone is part of an accountability system that is um, concerned about obeying God. Far too many are going to put up with offended people hoping to contain the bad fruit and that they will eventually stop or get healing. But the problem is they destroy many others in the way because they think everyone is wrong and they are right. They don't know how to receive unconditional love, correction, or instruction. So healing is often nearly impossible unless they are confronted and given very clear expectations to stay. They've become unteachable in their desire to be honored and respected and right. And they would rather argue than have peace with anyone. So you need to be very careful about not addressing someone who is verbally offended 
and stirring that into the mix, that needs to be stopped quickly. Offended people want to be valued and heard, and we can listen to them, we can give them unconditional love, offer advice, and show them their need to heal. Be kind, but be firm. Set healthy boundaries and explain to them why. Give the grace and mercy that Jesus gives you and me. This is very much about my life as well. We need to guide them to a place of peace and love, forgiveness and hope, and speak the truth in love. And it's really helpful if you can give examples on what kind of behavior is causing issues and instruct them on how to walk it out. Make suggestions of what they can think about and pray about and work on. Give them very tangible things to do. Things that they can see, that they can hear, they said, that they know they did. Get very specific with them. Work with them and not against them in hopes of leading them to a place of receiving exactly what they're seeking. Love, value, and to be used by God and others. God is far more interested in our character than he is our anointing. And I know that's not commonly known, but it's a no-brainer. When you see that people have anointings, which we see many that have these anointings that are amazing, but they will not discipline their character. They will not keep their relationships in order. Nobody wants them. Nobody wants them. They're a scandal waiting to happen. They're going to cause some negative attention to come to your ministry. So they may have some incredible gifting, but if they can't keep their life out of everyone's concerning view, I know that I don't know too many that want to bring them in that I that I admire as ministry leaders. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.21 to 22 says, In a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor, some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself of the latter, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. So God uses fire to build our character. 1 Timothy 1, 6 through 7 says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that perishes, though it may be tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Here's your answer. We can all seem loving and kind when we need to be, but then we're caught off guard. And the way we act under pressure is the real us, not the way that we can act when we are controlling how we act. The fire of affliction, trials, and tribulations will show us our sins of anger, bitterness, strife, and envy, etc., etc. The fires of trials and tribulations cause our sin and character defects to surface and we get to choose to deal with them or we can ignore them. We can justify our bitterness, our unforgiveness, anger, envy, and resentment. Once they surface, we want to look at the people who hurt us and blame them instead of resolving the issue that is within our own hearts because it's surfacing in us, not them. When we blame others and defend ourselves, we then become unable to see our true condition. We are blinded to it. When we will not face and deal with our issues, we are not going to move forward into the destiny that God has for us. He stops it. God puts us in very difficult trials to mature, refine, and strengthen us, never to destroy us. We generally grow in the tough times and not the easy times. If maturity came easy, we would all be mature but our roots will go down deeper and deeper. We will become stronger and able to withstand whatever comes our way as we move ahead with God. I am a completely different person than I was a few years ago, and that is probably exactly why. I've had to learn almost every day how to act a different way than I acted before. When you refuse the test and you become offended, you often become bitter and angry 
and disqualify yourself from true service in God. If you run from the trials and testing, you are refusing growth and maturing. And some, they get hurt and they never recover, and that is their choice. They allow the hurt that someone sent their way, whether they meant to or not, to steal their entire destiny, meaning their eternal reward, all of it. They handed it all over, over an offense for eternity. Even Jesus learned obedience by the things he suffered. According to Hebrews 5.8, Jesus suffered many wrongs. None of them were his fault, yet he never took his eyes off of his assignment. To become free from offense, you must recognize that you're hurt because pride would like to keep you from admitting that you've been hurt. You must also next forgive those who hurt you or those that you think hurt you. And if you do not forgive, God allows tormenting demons to come until you will. And most of us have chosen this path at times and I can't think of a worse thing to have happen than to be tormented. And when a person is choosing to be tormented, I don't know what the other person did, but it can't be nearly as bad as what you're now doing to yourself by allowing torment, by refusing to forgive. Forgiveness is not based on whether the one who offended repents or changes. It is an issue in your heart, my heart. Offense is our issue, not someone else's issue. It is between God and ourselves. A person who cannot forgive has definitely forgotten the great debt that has been forgiven them. We must also receive deliverance from offense by forgiving and blessing. We have to tear down the thought that becomes the argument against the truth of the word of God. And we have to be very aggressive with the thoughts that allow you to dwell on offense, unforgiveness, anger, they contradict the word of God. You have to find whatever way necessary to stop them from talking to you. I would suggest the audio Bibles. We love those. I would make sure that earbud was in my ear so that it was loud. I would definitely use the word in my ear to counter that. We also need to pray for the person who has hurt us. Matthew 5:44 says, but I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. So it's very important that we pray for them because the offense is going to continue to pop back up in my experience if I don't continue to pray for them. If I keep praying for them, it doesn't rage at me like it would. Another act we need to do is, if possible, we need to try to amend the relationship um, if it's possible. There are some, it is not possible. They're not safe people to us. And it, but if it's possible, if it's a family member or it's, it's someone that God has really prompted you to try to make peace in this situation because it's causing issues for a lot of people around you. And we don't want others getting caught in the trap of offense because of your situation. If it's some that, a situation like that, it would be wisdom and loving to others to try to get that worked out. Matthew 5, 21 to 24 says, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. It's always better to take the high road. Humble yourself, apologize, take the high road. It takes maturity to do this, ask for forgiveness. Taking the first step is harder for the person who is hurting. That's why Jesus said, go to them. Standing up for yourself and your rights does not bring peace and reconciliation. Lay down your need to protect yourself, to protect your pride and your rights in order to be restored to the person who has offended you or you have offended, if possible. This is not possible in many situations. When there's abuse involved, this is not the, the road to take. But this is like in families, churches, in settings where it is beneficial to the whole community. If it's an abusive situation, you separate from them. Proverbs 29, 11, sensible people control their anger. 
and their temper. They earn respect by overlooking wrongs. When the apostle Peter asked Jesus, how many times are we to forgive others? Jesus said, we're to forgive 70 times seven, and that's a lot. His point was to never tire of forgiving others. Forgiveness should become a natural emotion as we walk out our life in Christ. If we're a disciple of Christ, which is the only way born again looks, then forgiveness has to become a natural default. It's hard to develop a spirit of offense if our default and our focus is to forgive first. Ephesians 4, 2 through 3 says, Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. If we allow ourselves to get offended, it puts our pride, our ego, and our emotions between us and God. And God says in 1 Corinthians 13, 5, do not allow yourself to be provoked. 1 Corinthians 13, 5, always believe the best of every person. 1 Peter 4, 8, love covers a multitude of sin. Luke 6, 27, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Luke 6, 28, bless those who curse you. And Luke 6, 28, pray for those who spitefully use you. Luke 6, 37, forgive and you will be forgiven. Mark 11, 26, if you do not forgive those who hurt you, your Father in heaven will not forgive you either. Probably the worst consequence of all because you have to be forgiven to live with him in eternity. When we find ourselves getting offended, we're choosing to not listen to God. We're shutting him out. We're instead allowing our emotions to dictate how we respond to a situation instead of listening what God has already told us to do. And we're fully convinced that we're entitled to this offense, that we're right about what we're doing about the offense. We're never right if what we believe or feel or think is in opposition to what God says. We sin when we choose to get offended, period. We sin when we choose to embrace bitterness and unforgiveness at any time. We sin when we choose to think about it, talk about it, think about it, talk about it, think about it, talk about it. Jesus is worth choosing to repent and to extend grace and forgiveness to others that we expect them to give to us. We need to stay humble and teachable. We also need to reconcile if it's within the community and worth, if it's going to impact, as I said, try not to make this everybody's mess. Forgive, let the offenses go, walk in love and forgiveness, and allow the Holy Spirit to restore his anointing onto your life because getting offended blocked the anointing. So become unoffended by humbling yourself, forgiving, and loving without any expectations. It's acceptable to have expectations to those close to you in ways not associated with this subject. We can expect people to obey the laws on the road. We can expect our family members to be honoring. Everybody has to clean the house. There are expectations of that sort not, not related to this subject. But the greatest expectation we need to have is that God will help us to respond like Christ to all situations. Jesus and seeing people we love in heaven soon should make it worth any sacrifice we need to make. Because if we were allowed to see hell and even people we despised there and it did not severely impact us, then we're probably going there ourselves. We should feel terrified of having anyone we know end up in hell. So it would be worth it to try to do what is within your power to make peace. I'm going to um, add my sources and a prayer to the comments also this time. Precious Lord, you have given us your word, which gives us far more information than we need on how to walk out our genuine faith with you, the kind that will last through all eternity, the kind that won't end up apostate, falling away in confusion and temptation. 
when we are a disciple of Jesus Christ, we, we will not fall away. We will never give you up for anything. We will never worship a cheap idol instead of you. You are the most amazing one many of us will have ever even imagined. I cannot imagine losing you. I ask that you would please help us in this area. This is a very difficult area for me. It's a difficult area, I assume, for a lot of people. And I thank you for your grace. Thank you for your willingness to continue to bear with us as we struggle to become Christ-like, especially in this area. We forgive all of our offenders. We bless them. And we ask that you would bless them in such powerful ways. I ask that of the things that are just in this, this group that are just pretty big struggles for us, I ask that you would please help us. Please help us with these situations. Help us to have peace. Help us to know if we're to do anything. We ask that you would really be clear with us on what to do. And I ask that you help any of those who are in that group who are thinking that they are saved. They've prayed a prayer of profession of faith, but they have no possession of your Holy Spirit leading and guiding them daily. I pray that you would convict them of the danger of that area, that there will be a big price to pay if they don't turn from wickedness and become genuinely born again and a follower of Jesus Christ. I ask that you would please convict them and help them to know they can't serve their flesh and you at the same time. So I ask you to have your way and bring a great harvest in our area. We want revival. We want to see people set free. We want to see miracles, God. So you, I thank you that you will get us ready and that you will let us be part of the great end time harvest. And I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.